What do we do when things go wrong? Plans don't work out. Job doesn't come through. Our beloved pastor leaves. Break a wrist in a car wreck. What do we do? We should do exactly what the writer of Hebrews spoke to his Jewish Christian friends who were wavering in their faith. They had experienced persecution, more was coming, and they were thinking about retreating back into the safety of Judaism because it was accepted and recognized by the Roman government. And toward the end of this letter he wrote to them, he said those words that Darren read for us a few moments ago. In verse 3, Hebrews 12, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. No matter what's happening, no matter what we experience, no matter what comes our way, that's what we need to do. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Whether it's a church without a pastor or a believer seeking direction, someone facing tragedy or loss, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. In October of 2020, I had the privilege of standing in this pulpit and supplying for Brother Jay, and I preached from this same verse, this same theme, and I shared with you, those of you who were present that day, that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus' incarnation and on his life and teaching and on his atonement. Those are the three points of my sermon that day. His incarnation, Jesus was God in the flesh. On his life and his teaching, love God, love others, walk in obedience, and on and on we could go through the Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount, his miracles, all those things. We keep our eyes focused on his atonement. He paid a debt he didn't owe, like that song says. I owed a debt I couldn't pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. Amazing grace. He paid the debt I could not pay. That's what atonement is. Jesus paid our debt. We need to keep our eyes fixed on those things. But today I want to take three more words and follow that same theme. We need to keep our eyes focused on his presence, on his power, and on his provision. On his presence. In John 14, verses 16 through 18, Jesus is telling his disciples that he's going away, but he's going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And there in verse 18, he says, he will be with you. And who is he? The Holy Spirit, Christ's very presence in his spirit. And he said, he will be with you and he will be in you. He will be in you. One of the very first verses I memorized as a teenager who discovered scripture memory was Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who liveth in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And what did Paul write in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, the end of that verse, he said, speaking of the mystery of the gospel, this is it, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We are indwelled by his spirit. If you have turned from sin and self and trusted Jesus as your savior, his spirit has come into you. He lives in you. We are made alive by his living presence, alive spiritually. We who were dead spiritually are made alive. Christ in us. We need to keep our eyes fixed on his presence. He lives in us. 
And he assures us that at the very end, Matthew 28, verse 20, he said, And I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's here. He's with us. He's indwelling us. Someone else may leave us. Someone else may fail us. But he never will. He is always here. Now, how do you know that? Well, I just have this, I just have this warm feeling inside. I'm just, I just know that he's here because I feel it. No. Now, you may feel something. But it's on the authority of his word. That's where we stand. Not on any feeling. Feelings can change with the weather. It's not about feeling. I don't know if Jason was able to do it or not, but I, I shared with him the little graphic from the Campus Crusade for Christ, Four Spiritual Laws track. You may have seen that. They talk about feeling in that track. Where do feelings fit in? And so the illustration is an old-fashioned train. Engine, coal car, caboose. Wouldn't it be fun to see one of those again? And smell the smoke. The engine is the fact. That's what moves the train. The coal car is the fuel that energizes the engine. And the illustration says the engine is the fact. The coal car is our faith. And it is our faith invested in the fact that moves our lives. And what does the caboose do? They don't have those anymore, but back in the day, they just follow along behind. Feelings may come, feelings may go, but they don't drive the train. And feelings don't drive our walk with him. The authority of God's word, the facts that are spoken and our faith in them, he said, I'm with you. I'm indwelling you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so he is here. He is present. He is with us. He is within us. Keep our eyes fixed on that. And then second, I said we keep our eyes, or we should, on his power. We, uh, we quote from Matthew 28, 1920, the Great Commission, usually in the context of evangelism, what is the basis for evangelism? Same basis as the basis for our lives and our walk with him. He said, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, it doesn't matter what is going on in your life or mine. It doesn't matter what's going on. Uh, in our community, it doesn't matter what's going on politically in our country. It doesn't matter what's going on economically around the world. It doesn't matter what's going on in a conflict here or there. No matter what the appearances might be on this planet, all authority is vested in him. He has all authority, all power. We need to keep our eyes fixed on that. How many of you are or have ever been distracted by clouds of spiritual darkness? If you never, any of you ever had to struggle with something as dark as demon possession? Oh, we don't see that much. We don't know about that. Not likely. Not very likely at all. Why? Because we are a body of people who have been delivered. In fact, the scripture speaks very clearly about that in Acts 26, 20, 17, and 18, and, and then again in Colossians 1, 13, where Paul wrote very clearly that we have been delivered from the dominion of darkness. From the dominion of darkness. And transferred into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, there are spiritual powers at work in our world. We're all a little mystified when we read Ephesians 6. It speaks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places and all that. And How have you come in contact with that? How has that been an issue for you? All the most, most of us have experienced is 
the temptation that comes through that door of the flesh and our own evil hearts. But that kind of stuff is out there. It rules in this world, in other people, who have not been delivered from the kingdom of darkness. And God's power protects us. And God's power is at work, and Jesus' authority has already defeated the forces of darkness. We're just waiting for the final bell, aren't we? It's already been settled. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, we are told very clearly that the power that is at work in us presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the power that is at work in us is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And I wring my hands in fear of standing before friends to preach. (laughs) There's power available to us. One of the songs we sang this morning Sounds a lot like it's based on Isaiah 40, 31, 32. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus' power. Alexander McLaren, one of my favorite Preachers from 100 plus years ago, an English Baptist preacher, preaching on this passage from Isaiah 40, suggests that these three things that Isaiah uses as illustrations suggest realities that we experience. He said, mounting up with wings like eagles suggests the miraculous. We're given wings and we're lifted up over the circumstance, whatever the circumstance is. Have you experienced some miraculous moving of God's Spirit in your life? We could all bear testimony to some event where God just moved miraculously. He lifted us up with wings over the circumstance, altered it, changed it. And then McLaren suggests that running and not growing weary suggests that we are enabled in our own effort and in his power to alter the circumstances ourselves. There are things that we have to address and we have to deal with, and our action has an impact on them in the power and the strength that he gives. And then walk and not faint. McLaren suggested that these are the times when no miraculous intervention, nothing's going to alter the circumstance we're facing, No ability on our part to manipulate it in any way and change it. It is what it is. Death of a loved one being that final circumstance that cannot be altered. And he says, walking and not fainting suggests God's power at work in us to change us by the circumstances. Transform us by what we're facing. So the picture is of the miraculous that lifts us over the circumstance and alters them and changes them. And then those circumstances that we were empowered to attack on our own, change them in some way. And then the reality of those things in life that just cannot be changed. They're not going to go away. But we can be changed by them. The power of Jesus... First and foremost is the power that changes the human heart, that transforms us. I think Jason may have also created another little graphic for me, a triangle, Jesus at the top, or God, I don't know how he put it, there it is. We're at one corner of the triangle, circumstances are at the other. So where is your eye focused when circumstances go awry. Are you looking this way, laser focused on the circumstance? 
Are you looking this way, trusting that he has his eye on your circumstances? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. And then finally, keep our eyes fixed on his provision. Philippians 4, 19, I'll read in a moment. The context being Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, written from prison. And just to put it in perspective, I want to reflect for a moment on verse 13, where Paul writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I'll never forget walking into the youth room in Sunday school one day and seeing a poster on the wall. Somebody had found this poster. And here's a little bit short kid with a basketball in his hand going up for a slam dunk. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, that could be inspiring, but it's never going to happen. <laughs> it's never going to happen. And Paul wasn't talking about those kinds of accomplishments. He had been beaten. He had been shipwrecked. He had been imprisoned. And he's writing to his friends at Philippi to encourage them in their faith. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can endure privation. I can endure abuse. I can endure persecution. I can even endure death through him who strengthens me. That's the context of that verse. And then he says in verse 19, And my God shall supply all your needs out of his riches in glory. Does us well every now and then to stop and take inventory, you know, between wants and needs. When it comes down to it, what do we really need? I need air. I need air. A little nourishment would help. I need shelter. Maybe I need transportation. Jesus walked everywhere he went. What do we need? We need to evaluate the way we have taken wants and put them in the need category. And he said, I shall supply all your needs out of my riches in glory. So what are your needs? He'll supply them. Maybe not the wants. Maybe not the wants. I'll supply them. What are your needs? The Voice of the Martyrs magazine came this week. You're familiar with Voice of the Martyrs? If you're not, I want to make you aware of the Voice of the Martyrs. Here's the magazine, Voice of the Martyrs. You can Google it and sign up. The main article is about religious persecution in southern Mexico. There are groups in small villages in the mountains of southern Mexico that are still worshiping in the same pagan way their ancestors did. They call it Christopaganism because they have adopted a little bit of Roman Catholicism, but mostly their ancient paganism. And so those who come to know Jesus truly and personally are out of step with the majority of those in their little remote villages, and they become persecuted. There's one article right here you can't see, but this couple, um, when he became a believer, the village kicked them out of their house, took their property, and took away their papers. In essence, they were no longer Mexico citizens. They had help. Their needs were met through Aurelio and Ruth, the main articles about Aurelio and Ruth, who spend their time going from village to village giving out Bibles and setting up what they call um, outreach bases where they teach children and parents. And on one of their excursions, someone pulled up beside them, blocked their truck, 
They had 300 Bibles in the back of the truck they were going to deliver. And these uh, Zapatistas, there's a rebel group in southern Mexico, a liberation army fighting against the Mexican government. And these guys don't like believers either because we teach things that go counter to what they're up to. And so they didn't want them doing what they were doing. And so they kidnapped them, beat Aurelio, took them on a long journey, intending to kill them. The leader of the group left them with two who were supposed to carry out the task. And he pulled the trigger of a gun that didn't fire. They had doused them with gasoline. He struck a match that wouldn't light. And in frustration, they turned to each other and said, What's going on? Why won't the gun fire? Why won't the match strike? And they left them. They left them. And they survived and they have thrived. They've planted more than 500 churches, it says right here. Established nearly 50 of their outreach bases with at least three indigenous people groups. Each Saturday, more than 5,000 youth hear the gospel and learn from the Bible. And you know, the dominant thing in this article, the testimony of their faith is, this is what God wants us to do. They can kill us tomorrow. This is what God wants us to do. And we're going to do it. Wow. My God shall supply all your needs out of his riches in glory. Even if you die while he's doing it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We know where we're going. I was reading recently again the story of Polycarp. You ever heard of Polycarp? He was the bishop of Smyrna. Smyrna is one of those cities that Jesus addresses the church at Smyrna in the book of Revelation. Let me just read what he says to them. This is in 90 to 95 AD, as John has his vision on the island of Patmos. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna, meaning to the pastor of the church, write, The first and the last who was dead and has come to life says, I know your tribulations and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what, they, what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Polycarp was pastor of the church in that town about 65, 70 years later. Emperor worship was rampant and the demand was clear. Say, Caesar is Lord or die. They wanted the preacher. He would be the example they would set. So the city rulers finally found him when he decided to stop running and let them find him. They have a stack of wood and a stake, and they're going to tie him to it and burn him. And they give him one last chance. Deny Jesus, and we'll set you free. And he said, 80 and 6 years, I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. And how can I now blaspheme my king who saved me? They lit the fire, and it was like there was a chimney effect or something. The blaze were out here, and he was in a void. Flames weren't touching him. So they took a spear and thrust it through him. One of his church members was an eyewitness and wrote it down so we could hear the story. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and his power. He will deliver us even if it's in the flame. 
We know where we're going. So, in the face of whatever might be going on personally for you, in this transition we are in without a pastor, a vote next Sunday for a search committee. Let's keep our eyes fixed on his presence, his power, and his provision.